And I would like to thank Global Strategy for hosting this event, also for the invitation. Our topic today is memoir for Mark Coop, reasons, repercussions, and Chinese links and options for the West. And this discussion is being streamed live on Facebook and globalstratview.org. It's G-L-O-B-A-L-S-T-R-A-V-I-E-W dot O-R-G. And any attendees, if you have questions, you're welcome to post your question in that uh, on the chat, in the chat, and then we'll share with the panelists and have them answer the questions. So I will let you introduce our three panelists today. Uh, I will introduce each one of you and please briefly introduce yourself after that. So the first one we have here is M2 On. Uh, he is the General Secretary of Nationalities Alliance of Burma in the United States. He was born in Myanmar, lived in Singapore before, and now resides in the United States. He works, uh, includes working at organizations which deal with relations with the government, including United Nations. Welcome to please briefly introduce yourself and what is Nationalities Alliance of Burma? Hi, uh, everybody. Good morning. Um, very nice to meeting you here. And thank you for organizing uh, such a wonderful, um, you know, the discussion panel over here in GSB. So yeah, um, as um, Paris Hound introduced to me, uh, my name is M2. M2, I'm Gachin. I'm originally from Burma and currently living in the uh, Maryland state. And then um, I'm, uh, I am the general secretary of the Nationalities Lion of Burma, which, in, um, which is a kind of the network organization in the United States. So it, which includes like the Arakan American uh, community and more uh, like a more American organization and Gachin Lion and then uh, Shan as a culture association, and then um, other uh, organization like Chin organization. And so we have totally seven, you know, the um, um, ethnic uh, nationality. Uh, we gather together and working together uh, for our, you know, the um, equality and our, you know, the pur purpose of the revolution over here in the United States. We are formed in, uh, 2019, um, June 15. So there's a brief history of my background. Thank you. Very wonderful. Thank you, M2. Uh, next, we have Naomi Jean Gold, and uh, she had been covering the United States, Japan, and Myanmar extensively for primarily American public radio. I actually heard her story some uh, PRI. In Myanmar, she has uh, covered a range of topics from uh, politics to religion and arts, and especially became a point person to follow on the country's telecommunications revolution. She first moved in Burma in 2013 following the country's historic resumption of press freedom. And uh, she also did academic research on the intersection of media, technology, politics, and the arts. She is also the editor, co-founder, and the co-host of a news storytelling podcast in Asia. Uh, she also had the background in music production, and I see we both have a liking of Utada Hikaru. Welcome, Naomi. Please briefly introduce yourself if I miss anything there. Thank you so much, and I love the extra music bit. Um, <laughs> I feel like that was a pretty uh, thorough introduction for this for now. I'm, I'm a primarily a public radio journalist, spent a lot of time reporting in Burma, I feel like, I guess we're using both Myanmar and Burma at today's um, event. Um, also spent a lot of time in Japan and I look forward to speaking with you all today. Great, thanks Naomi. Um, the uh, last panelist is uh, Ralph Mahanja. He's from India. He's a veteran journalist. He has 29 years of media experience, including 23 years in news channels in various capacities as special correspondents, senior editor, senior executive editor, and consultant editor. Welcome, Rao. Please briefly introduce yourself in one minute. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Uh, during my career, I have covered uh, the union government in India, uh, northeastern states which share border with Burma, uh, the insurgency there, 
I have covered Kashmir, uh, Jammu and Kashmir for a very long time. So you have already introduced uh, what all I have uh, been doing all these years. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. All right, thank you. So uh, let's go into the discussion uh, session right now. So I will direct questions to each one of you. And uh, if you have related information or opinions you would like to share, uh, please just let me know. And then I will direct that question to you after the person who uh, is speaking finish his or her remarks. So first question I would direct to Naomi first. I would uh, wanna know, you know, it had been almost four months since the military started taking control over the, uh, the, the government and the country. Uh, what is the, the cost is from your opinion uh, of this? The cost? Uh, the, the reason behind the coup. Oh, the cause. Um, you know, I think there have been a lot of, there's been a lot of pontificating about this, like why, what was the strategy behind it? What were they thinking? And I think ultimately it comes down to some people's thirst for power. And I think, you know, the assessments that I've seen that I think, um, seem most on the nose was just the thirst for power. It wasn't that strategic of a move. Um, I think we've seen that over and over again in Burmese history um, with the generals who've been dictators, is that a lot of their actions from a strategy perspective actually aren't the most prudent. Um, so, I mean, I you could draw back and say, yes, they wanted to stop the further Democrats, like the further, you know, democratizing of Burma. But I think it also has a lot to do with like a couple people's thirst for power. Mm. So. so what is uh, M2? I want to direct that question to you as well. Uh, what do you think is the reason behind this? All right. Um, thank you. So um, let me um, give you some brief um, history of the Myanmar background. So Myanmar has, you know, faced various ethnic conflicts since uh, shortly after its independence in 1948. So at the time, you know, fight, peace, effort have filled living Myanmar in what constitutes um, the world's longest running civil war. So but since the country November 8th election 2020, there has been a flurry of meeting between the ethnic arm organization and the military, known as the Tamador. So these unexpected talks are the first sign of progress toward a resolution of seemingly um, intertable war. So that is, so if the science can learn from the past and the, create a fresh inclusive renewal of the peace process, that drawn on the country's diverse vice advocating for the peace. So previously, you know, the um, peace process have failed to consider the diverse vision of peace among the numerous um, um, ethnic communities across Myanmar. So choosing instead of relying on the vision of elite and the actor. So thousands of innocent people, um, you know, um, Myanmar having flee in the state of uncertainty. Uh, reminded of the <coughs> ADA uprising, during which student organized national protests demanding democratic rule were met with the violence and thousands of casualties. Um, so no ethnic minorities have been spared uh, from the military dictatorship. So many people have fled Myanmar and the internally displaced. Dating further back, the conflict between the Korean Kachin and all the ethnic people and the military is the longest, uh, you know, the um, internal war in Myanmar and the longest civil war in the war spanning more than seven decades. So um, past uh, few months, military leaderships were angry at the result of November 2020 uh, election at Myanmar, Obama. So the NLD won 83% of the available seats in Myanmar's House of Representatives and House of Nationalities. So which is similar to America House of Representatives and the Senate respectively. So what 
Uh, Fort Worth was a series of failed attempts by the military, you know, to appeal the Bami Supreme Court to overturn um, the election result on cuts of the voter fraud. So um, there will be another, you know, the interest of the uh, coup, um, you know, is kind of the individual, uh, individual interest. Um, is kind of the every military general like uh, me online has uh, you know they protected his um, uh, family and financial interests and the military and criticize economic domination. So me online spent much of his uh, mm -hmm. military career as a quick uh, publicity shy officer, you know, and steadily um, are promoted to higher position before grabbing, you know, the um, absolute power at dawn on February 1st. So five months before the uh, mandatory retirement at age 65 on July 3rd. So among other goes the military commander in chief apparently hopes he has protected himself, a family, military college from positive in investigation over their extensive inclusion financial deeds and economic holding. So that's about mm -hmm. um, the um, personal, uh, in, uh, you know, individual interest. Another one is, you know, the partnership interest. So the coup leader enjoyed this strong support from the fellow officer, including those who have benefited from the military very business venture. Um, so me online, his family and his uh, military commander, other general and giant that made their financial activity, especially, you know, the problematic to measure without, uh, uh, without um, public uh, scrutiny or accounting over their profit and transfer of ownership as well. So there will be another, you know, the uh, interest uh, causes. So military sure. is a kind of the uh, military institution interest. Uh, so it's not clear how much of those big ticket contracts ranging from road, railroad, and, you know, bond. And the last one, it is um, geo geographical interest is kind of the China interest. So everybody already knew about the interest. Thank you. All right, we'll, we'll, we'll be talking about that later, but thank you. I think from Naomi and, and Susan, so we hear power grabbing, we can power people on power and people also want economic benefits or profits. I wanna hear from uh, Raul, uh, what's your take on the, uh, the reason behind the military coup in uh, Myanmar? I believe that uh, the 2020 elections where uh, Aung San Suu Kyi's uh, party uh, had a landslide victory, uh, they secured uh, somewhere around 396 of 476 seats uh, in the combined houses of the national parliament. This made, uh, and her efforts to uh, reach out to ethnic parties to join it, join them to form a unity government and, uh, uh, and build a democratic federal union. This made uh, uh, the Myanmar's military very insecure. The reason being that uh, they thought that uh, uh, if such a government uh, gets into place, the 2008 constitution, where they had, uh, they were able to uh, secure many privileges like 25% reserve seats and control over internal security, defense, and border affairs, this can be overturned and the constitution can be changed. So I believe these uh, these were the uh, insecurity. These were the this this is the sense of insecurity they had, and a uh, lot of uh, things which has happened uh, and the coup has a uh, lot of things uh, uh, which uh, are concerned with this uh, particular insecurity. Thank you, Rao. Uh, I would like go go back to M two uh, again because uh, I know uh, you know in the past four months so many things happened been happening. Uh, protesters are being arrested, even killed. Reporters, of course, the, the, the freedom of the press have been suppressed over there. Uh, so what is the latest situation that you know uh, from your sources uh, over there right now? What is the current, uh, what does it look like right now over there? Uh, this question is for M2. I'm sorry, I'm muted. Um, so military agenda shut down five media outlet. You know, they are Democratic Vital Obama, Vikes of Obama, Mizima, Myanmar Now, Seven Days, and Kitty. So, you know, the Myanmar agenda is seeking control of the uh, flow of the information by putting a threat pressure on journalists, imposing strict uh, censorship laws and internet blockades. So since the military 
could um, uh, took over the field very fast. Rumors and false reports have been making the rounds, you know, the, particularly on social media network, such as Facebook. So the nation it is the uh, nation's most important and widely used platform. So um, at the same time, you know, people hunger for information raising, you know, the massively uh, prompting many of them to um, circumvent of official barriers with the help of virtual private networks to know what is going on within the country. So this make a professional reporting and analysis by journalists even more important. So the work of journalists is challenging even um, before the coup has become a front touch, uh, you know, the, since the coup. So the military agenda accused the media of fueling the protests and making its work more difficult. So uh, security mm -hmm. forces have, uh, you know, the often targeted and attack journalists by reporting on the protests. So majority of the editors and reporters in the country currently refrain from identifying themselves as member of the press, besides that, you know, um, uh, the military having placed more journalists behind bars. So nearly uh, 5,353 people have been arrested in connection with the coup, including 34 journalists over there. So some of that has been since released on bail, but they face long prison sentence. So Myanmar Journalist Network and Media Association uh, uh, you know, is a kind of support colleges who are being arrested for trading with the legal action over there, which is good. But um, you know, the many journalists who haven't been arrested yet are being watched every day, anytime, anywhere. So anyone who wanted to, you know, the uh, obtain up to date and and censor information had to assess outlet uh, such as you know the DVB. Uh, which is um, Democratic Vice of Burma, BBC, uh, RFA, or uh, even, you know, the which of a Burmese language program. So um, the last one that I'd like to mention about, you know, the Japanese journalist, we already knew that, who was detained in Myanmar and charged with spreading false news during the crackdown on media. So uh, he got released on Friday, uh, May 14, 2021. And so the last one, uh, 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 you know, the um, C CNN chief international co correspondent, Glass Award, she's she been there, but she's been invited by the uh, military uh, journalists. And the last one I would just like to highlight it about the um, Brahmai, uh, which is uh, Michina News uh, Journalist. Uh, he, uh, Brahmai founded the Michina News Journalist in Kitchen State, uh, which is an independent Willie News Journal. Um, in, in 2000, uh, it, 2012, he started with the employees uh, uh, covering the northern state of Kachin. On April 29, the military revoked the journalist, uh, this journalist, Brahmai, uh, is kind of the Michigan News Journal, uh, publishing the license. So it's a very sad news. Thanks. Sure. Thank you, M2. It sounds like the, uh, the media situation there is in very dire situation. I would like to next. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, if I yeah. could just jump in for a second. Um, you know, there are some of the organizations that M2 mentioned that have had their licenses revoked. Um, so like Mizima or Kit Pit Media, um, other journalists, other offices like the Irrawaddy have just been like told to shut down, but they've still kept reporting. Um, and that's kind of been really important. And I think what's kind of important in all of this to mention is the internet shutdowns that have been happening. Um, because starting in February, we saw total shutdowns and then the military went to nightly shutdowns and then they started shutting down just m all mobile data. Um, and then, uh, you know, on and on to like the only thing left was fiber to the home, which is rather expensive and not that many people have it. H however, I'll say what I've kind of been astounded by is people's ability to still get information and spread information and what um what's been happening so for example you know there are all these you know secret groups on like uh, uh encrypted apps like telegram right um and some of these groups that do fact checking of the news will send out F sms messages um every day with like hey here's what you should know and one thing i've been both surprised and kind of pleased at you know Facebook and Burma really had so much misinformation and disinformation. Um, and now, although that still exists and is part in part is fueled by the military, um, 
there's also been an incredible surge of interest by young people and well, not just young people trying to get become like discerning news readers and get the actual facts. Um, just, I mean, yeah, I'm in like just, you know, two different telegram groups that are just fact checking groups. So those are just citizens. That sounds amazing. Actually, that was my question to you. Uh, what I was about to ask you about, you know, besides of the, the, the regular, you know, international or more established media, how people using social media or other methods to communicate and, and, and spread information. Uh, but besides that, I also want to know, you know, because you've been living there, you lived there for a couple of years, uh, you know, local people over there. Uh, what's their, you know, life look like right now and are they what's their mental state are they uh ready to 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 still fight for the the belief that they believe in the democracy or the lifestyle they want or are they being scared they are more like we're gonna retreat and wait for the things to cool down Naomi yeah um so I guess to answer just a little bit more on the first and then I'll go to the second, which is just a very, very big question. But I'll just say also like um, there are new like pirate radio stations. Um, some student activists have like put together their own like newspapers and are distributing them. Um, in terms of how are people feeling right now? Um, you know, I can say from perspective as a reporter and as a, a researcher and people I've, I've spoken with over the last few months, um, you know, there, there are some people who at this point have a, at least a facade of, okay, well, we have to go along with our business and keep going. That doesn't mean I think that they've given up by any means. That doesn't mean that they don't care, but they're not the ones who are still doing a lot of the activism. Now, there's also, I think, a lot of people who are still um, very involved, um, but a lot, you know, right after the coup, a lot of the chatter about what was happening, people's strategies, what they were doing, it was on like public Facebook pages that anybody could read because people did not have privacy settings on their Facebook. And a lot of that has been driven underground. So, um, and, you know, obviously the military's extreme violence has also stopped the, the huge protests we were seeing, like in the carnival-like atmosphere we were seeing at the beginning. Um, but, you know, people are still finding, finding very creative ways to protest. The civil disobedience movement is still going strong I and mean, they just had to fire a lot of educators and engineers because they weren't going to pick up, um, you know, people are refusing to pay their taxes and their utility bills. And they fired a lot of engineers who weren't going to, you know, take care of those things. The, the military fired them. Um, but I, I think that there's a cynicism, but there is still a, I don't think people have been cowed into submission, I think you might not see it as readily on the surface, I, I, but it's very much there. I will also say, I just think that one thing that's important that doesn't really get mentioned a lot is just the, the, what, and what I feel um, is just like a collective sense of trauma. Uh, you, know, I, you know, a lot of people who had to go into hiding or jumping between houses um, and there's just like, there's just so much, um, yeah, from a mental health perspective, it, it's just, it's just really sad and awful. I'm glad that you, br you, you brought that up. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I said, I, I spent a couple of months in 2019 in Hong Kong covering the protest and the mental health issue was actually one of the things that people were discussing. They said, not only the protesters, they have been facing, you know, uh, uh, the clash with the police forces, tear gas and everything, they will have a lot of trauma. Also, just regular people, when that type of thing's happening right in front of your doorstep, they cause trauma as well. So the mental health issue, I'm, uh, I, I do believe it's gonna have to be addressed uh, 
one day or another. Uh, so uh, the next question I want to ask uh, Ralph, uh, you know, we we'll talk about what happened and what is happening right now. What consequences has the Myanmar military had been faced uh, from the international community, including, you know, United Nations, United States, what uh, the international community had, been, had done to this uh, thing that is happening over there. I, I know United States have posed some sanctions against some of the military leadership. Had that been effective, Raoul? The question is whether uh, these sanctions and these kind of uh, mayors, they have any effect because this is not the first time that Myanmar will be facing these kind of sanctions from the West. In 2003, the United States and 37 other OECD countries imposed comprehensive sanctions, sanctions on Myanmar. Uh, and, uh, you know, even those sanctions were wide ranging and uh, the impact of sanctions on Myanmar trade was significant during the sanctions. Myanmar, uh, div it what happened that time? Myanmar diversified both its products and uh, its trading partners. ASEAN emerged as a significant shock absorber, and uh, at the same time, Myanmar diverted its exports to South Korea and Japan. Uh, so I don't think these kind of sanctions will uh, have any effect on uh, Myanmar, which has a large, uh, largest trading partner in uh, China. So China has not uh, put any sanctions on uh, Myanmar, or nor India has uh, put any sanctions on or any other ASEAN country. So these are the immediate uh, trade partners of uh, Myanmar, and I don't don't think uh, uh, these countries, except uh, two or three countries in ASEAN, have taken very strong uh, uh, position on uh, Myanmar's coup. So this also reflects the kind of uh, uh, response uh, the Myanmar uh, coup is getting from uh, the immediate neighbors and other countries, and. Uh, you know, my, I can understand uh, as far as ASEAN is concerned, they have a motto that they will not in, uh, interfere in um, internal affairs of any other country. And this may be the guiding principle for uh, the, all their statements or uh, their behavior in this matter. But uh, if you think that, uh, if you say that uh, these sanctions or uh, the measures which have been taken by the international community will have any effect, I don't think so they'll have it. Well, I want to ask Naomi because uh, you know you have been reporting on Japan as well, and Japan actually has a lot of influence and huge investment uh, in, in uh, Myanmar. Uh, like we talked about that earlier. This Japanese uh, journalist uh, Yuki Kitazumi, he was arrested, but then uh, even faced a possible three years in prison. But then Japanese government got involved. He was released uh, just last week. And Japan currently, according to the Human Rights Watch in 2019, Japan's investment is 169 billion yen, which is 1.6 billion uh, US dollars uh, in there, and 15, uh, $140 million in grant aid and uh, $62 million in technology assistance to Myanmar. So it seems, and, and we see the, uh, the US officials, I believe your secretary Blinken actually said, that, you know, we're glad to see Japan's taking leadership role in dealing with the Burma situation. What is Japan doing right now? And does Japan has a more leverage and power to influence uh, the, the Burma politics and, and hopefully to peacefully resolve this? Um, so I think, you know, so Japan provides the most or like development assistance to Myanmar more than any country in the world. Um, the question is how much leverage do they really have with that? Um, and, you know, could China step in to fill a void? I mean, that's a whole other issue because, you know, some Chinese assets investments are at risk right now as well, but won't go down that road yet. Um, I, I think that, you know, I would have expected potentially Japan to put pressure on in a kind of quiet diplomatic way. Um, but actually in the last couple of days, the Japanese foreign minister came out and said that, um, I mean, essentially said that, essentially threatened to freeze all of their development assistance to Burma if things didn't change. 
Mm -hmm. um, and I was pretty surprised by that, how explicit and how public the statement was. Um, I think it was a real win for a lot of activists um, who have been putting pressure on the Japanese government to say something. I mean, I will also say, you know, how much leverage will it really have? Again, I don't, I don't really know that Minon Lang the, really responds to, to really well thought out strategy. Um, I mean, all indications are that he doesn't necessarily, right? You know, actually doing this coup cuts off a lot of economic possibilities um, for the country. I mean, you know, companies have been pulling out. Uh, that's actually one other big place that I think Japan, not the Japanese government, but, you know, Japanese entities have leverage um, is in the commercial world. Um, so the first company that pulled out of Myanmar following the coup was Kirin Beer. Um, they mm -hmm. said, this is not, you know, we didn't get involved in, in Myanmar to help, you know, mil like military dictatorship because they were working with a, a military owned beer company. Um, I think there are a lot of other ways. KDDI, which is one of Japan's largest um, uh, telecoms has a very has a very large investment in MPT, uh, a military telecom in Burma. So I think they have a lot of leverage there too. So commercially, I think there's quite a lot that could be done. Okay. Thank you, Naomi. Uh, and I want to you know ask Raul about you know of course India because India also have a big uh, influence and. Uh, uh, actually involved with the independence of uh, uh, Burma early in the, uh, in the stage. And uh, uh, with the investment, of course, India will be worrying about, you talked about that earlier, the Chinese uh, might step in and uh, uh, overtaking some of the, the interests that India might be caring about. So what is your opinion that the Indian government should do right now uh, to help with this situation? Look, as far as India's approach to the situation in Myanmar uh, uh, is concerned, we need to uh, see through the lens of uh, its relation, India's relation with China, letting its neighbor and a key uh, regional player fall, fall completely under the influence of Beijing would result in a major security concern for India. We understand that, uh, if everybody could understand that India has a very long border with Myanmar. And uh, a large part of that border is very porous. And uh, uh, we have uh, been facing, uh, in the past, we have faced uh, insurgency from that border. And there were uh, allegations that China was supporting that, uh, those uh, insurgents. So uh, it is a very difficult situation for India. And India has a very long, uh, a very uh, solid and long relationship with uh, Myanmar's military. And it is because that uh, Myanmar military has uh, uh, in fact, help in the, helped India in the past uh, to uh, rein in these uh, insurgent groups and to uh, fight these insurgent groups in northeast uh, eastern states of India. So India has a very special, uh, say, uh, uh, place for uh, uh, Myanmar and Myanmar's military and other people and people of Myanmar. So uh, in whatever uh, the, in the past, uh, the the statements of uh, Indian government have been. Uh, they have uh, said that uh, they would like to have uh, democracy reinstated in uh, Myanmar, but they have uh, not criticized uh, uh, Burmese or uh, Myanmar's military. So uh, India has to take uh, all these uh, things in consideration while approaching this uh, particular matter in case of uh, Myanmar. Because uh, if India uh, take any wrong step, in this case, it will have uh, another border. Uh, India is, al uh, is already facing a uh, Chinese threat uh, on its northern border. And, uh, uh, in, uh, and also uh, the border which is with Pakistan, which is a very close ally with China. So it will not like to destabilize uh, the Eastern Front uh, also, where uh, uh, there has been a history of insurgency and uh, problems uh, uh, there. So this is where Indian uh, problem uh, appears and uh, the Indian response appears. And that is why if you have seen that after, two, uh, the, after the coup, uh, two months of, after the coup, uh, Indian uh, 
India participated in uh, the annual day of uh, Myanmar's military, so, along with other countries, China and other countries also participated. So, uh, in I think that India will uh, have a policy of uh, non-interference in uh, Myanmar's internal affairs, but, but they will continue to engage with uh, whosoever uh, is in, uh, you can say, uh, helm of affairs in Myanmar. Thank you, Ralph. So it sounds like the uh, the Indian government have more. It's it's a more complicated issue for the India, uh, especially if you consider the Chinese factor. Uh, then I want to ask M two uh, because uh, you know I know you you organized the protest in the uh, the Ch Chinese embassy here in DC. I'm going to ask you about that later. But first, I want to know uh, what's your take on you know you know Myanmar and China has a a, a long border and the longest uh, 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 border uh, uh, country uh, uh, the Myanmar. And what is the political and the trade relations over there, uh, China and Burma? And uh, how big is the influence that China has over its domestic politics? Okay. All right, thank you, uh, Paris. So China and Myanmar have you know, the um, active bilateral relations with each other. So, um, but um, recently the relation between the China and Myanmar have faced some problems due to recent ongoing conflict with the ethnic Chinese rebel and Myanmar military near the border, as well as Burma recent holistics. So China and Myanmar relations to be extraordinarily good. Um, so China and Myanmar have um, established a comprehensive strategic partnership of cooperation and, you know, the um, highest level with the neighboring country. So saying that uh, Myanmar is China's south gate and China is Myanmar's home from. So these two countries are vital to each other's security and the strategy's defense. So Myanmar, uh, especially, you know, the our kitchen state shares a 2,000 kilometer border with Yunnan province of China. And so it has been deeply influenced by China's economics military and political support, so which is um, uh, consequently weakens uh, in, uh, the international sanctions. So China is now uh, not only Myanmar's largest trading partner, but also country's largest supplier of military weapons as well. So 60% 60, 60 of Myanmar's weapons were imported from China between 2014 and 2018. So, you know, um, when Myanmar was under two, 20 years of sanction from the West, you know, um, the, uh, Mr. Rao and Naomi already uh, mentioned about this sanction from the West. So China stuck on that, you know, the interference with the uh, internet affairs while carrying out um, extensive changes and cooperation with Myanmar in bold defense of Myanmar interests on the um, international state. So uh, after, the, uh, after the Tang Seng government came to power, the, um, the narrowly traded, uh, trading of mutual help and support has been continued and strengthened. So uh, Bami's government, um, you know, the 112 key business partner involves Chinese and Hong Kong funds. So in, including mm -hmm. China's very Wombo mine, Hong Kong, you know, the copper limited that operates the um, Lebedong copper mine is well-known copper mine in Burma. Um, so it is important to note that more than 90% of the 112 companies mentioned before have business cooperation with Myanmar's two largest military company, so MEHL, which is um, Myanmar Economic Holding Limited, and MEC, which is Myanmar Economic Corporation run by the military. So in uh, January 2021, so the right before the military see the power in Myanmar, Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi uh, met a military official, including uh, General Mei Online. So China has denied prior knowledge of you know, the involvement in the coup. So regarding with the um, a political um, point of view, so the, uh, on February uh, 2nd, you know, the uh, UN Security Council met the discussion uh, and uh, met, met uh, oh, so, so, yeah, met to discuss a proposal to issue the joint statement con uh, condemning the military action in Myanmar. But uh, as you all know, China and Russia vetoed the decision uh, saying that the international community should not take 
any action that will raise tension in Myanmar. That's what the China said. And then February that the China's uh, Chinese foreign ministry rejected the suggestion that China supported or gave tacit consent to the military group. group. So um, uh, the spokesperson, you know, the one when one being says China is a friendly neighbor of Myanmar. Uh, and uh, he said, we hope that all parties in Myanmar will probably handle their difference and uh, constitutional and legal framework and maintain political and social stability. So another one, you know, uh, happened in February 4th, the UN Security Council called for the release of Aung San Suu Kyi and other detain detainees and vice concern over the state of emergency. China, uh, at the time, China does not object it. So, uh, next uh, uh, move is that, you know, the um, other record, uh, like uh, uh, Ch Chinese playing Lenin in Myanmar is very popular. Oh, no, not a popular, you know, uh, everybody knows it's well known and circulated on social media, prompting, and, you know, the speculation is that Chinese te technical person have mm -hmm. arrived in the country to aid the military in the, you know, the internet blackout in the country, but in response to the rumor, Chinese embassy in Myanmar released a statement and saying that it is not, uh, you know, the um, Chinese technical person. They said they are just transporting the seafood, but we don't need any seafood from China. And then uh, the last one I'll, I'd like to highlight about the Chinese ambassador to Myanmar, Chang He says, Beijing was not informed in events and of the coup rumor is for helping in the military agenda. Set up a firewall to prevent, you know, the um, protesters from organizing online are uh, completely nonsense. That's what they said. So Chen also said that the situation in Myanmar is absolutely not what the China want to see. So, but China has a friendly relationship with both uh, Suji led NLD and the military as well. So since the coup in Myanmar public disconnect with the Chinese Communist Party has escalated and there have been uh, numerous reports, you know, the internet, uh, internet of Chinese plane transporting, you know, the technician to Myanmar to help with the firewall to protect the military. And the later the Chinese embassy in Myanmar issued a statement saying Chinese plane that are running in Myanmar on that day were not carrying technical personnel. And they said, just keep saying that it's a seafood. So, so it's, um, yes, yes. I'm so it sounds like the, the, the Chinese are playing a very, you know, careful game here. They don't want to, you know, l legitimize the, 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 the coup. At the same time, also want to keep it, you know, like you said, a support for uh, Suu Kyi. Um, so I, I want to ask you, so uh, you mentioned about some of the companies, uh, uh, the Chinese, uh, like the, the copper mine. Uh, the, the Chinese or Hong Kongese companies that have been doing business in, in uh, Myanmar, but they are, those companies are military owned. And we know some of the countries, including the United States, that post sanctions on those companies. And I'm assuming Chinese will not be happy about it because that will be, you know, uh, 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 affecting their own profit. So I know that you, you, you uh, organized a protest in uh, the Chinese embassy here in Washington DC back at February 6th. Did you get any response from the Chinese embassy and uh, uh, or the only thing you got was the, the official statement that you just mentioned? Um, yes, we did, you know, the um, uh, so many the protests in front of the um, uh, Chinese embassy. Um, yeah, um, I, actually we did not receive any response from the Chinese uh, government uh, regarding with the, this protest, but we are keep pressuring that, you know, and the, the last, the protest was the biggest, you know, the crowd ever for the multi-ethnic people were gathering in Washington, mm -hmm. D.C. So today we are um, again gathering, uh, gathering again in Washington, D.C., but not in front of the uh, Chinese uh, uh, Chinese embassy. Uh, I would say that we have the several uh, reasons for this protest. We den denounce, you know, the brutal killings of innocent civilian, you know, the including children and pregnant women by the Myanmar police force and the Tamadol. So mm -hmm. a lawful airstrike in the uh, ethnic minority, a uh, minority area has been, you know, uh, also killed by, uh, also killed many innocent civilian and displaced many other. That's why uh, we, we went to the um, uh, China, uh, in front of the Chinese embassy and we called for the, imme uh, 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 you know, the, we call the Im immediate release of all uh, who have been unlawfully uh, detained and uh, to end unlawfully right, you know, the arrest, detention and break-ins. Uh, 
So we ask for the strong action from the international community, not only the Chinese embassy, but uh, China is, you know, the, the, the major player for the military coup. That's why we went to the uh, military, uh, you know, the Chinese embassy to stop these, uh, you know, the Astro cities. So we call upon the people of the background nations and, you know, the Chris to stand, stand with us. Publicity going to mean the temporal uh, oppresses rule in every way possible in frame for a peaceful transition in Myanmar. So that's what happened. So it, we, we might not be, you know, the achieve immediately, but we, you, you know, we still need to, uh, you know, the keep demanding uh, about not only the Chinese embassy, but also we are also, you know, the uh, demanding the U United States and the um, international mm -hmm. community. So we will be keep doing all, all of those activities. Right, thank you, M2. Next question I want to ask Naomi. So, because uh, you spent some time there in the memoir. Uh, what, 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 based on your observation, what's the Chinese investment uh, influence over there over the years? And uh, uh, does China plays a role in the uh, Myanmar's uh, domestic politics? I know China had a good relationship with the previous you know, military government, but what was their relationship with the, you know, uh, the uh, LED? And uh, uh, what, what, are they happy with the current situation right now uh, when the coup is going on right now, Naomi? Yeah, I mean, I, um, I think they had a decent relationship with the NLD. I think that right now China is walking a bit of a fine line um, because you know, they don't want to publicly condemn the junta leaders. That kind of goes against their political interests. But at the same time, they've got a lot of investments that are now slightly at risk. Um, not just slightly, more than slightly. Um, they've got some gas pipelines. Uh, people who were guarding them were attacked and some were killed. Um, they're... Uh, Com you know, companies like even like Alibaba just invested a lot in um, a financial tech company in Burma, but with the internet being off, mobile data being off, that is, you know, who knows what could happen there. So, and I think also um, we've seen the rise of a lot of anti-Chinese sentiment among the public, um, which, and you know, there were some Chinese factories in Yangon that were burned. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, Taiwanese companies were telling their companies to like put a Taiwanese flag out front to show that you are not Chinese. I, I mean, the real issue there was that like it, it did stand the chance of becoming a lot of hatred towards uh, Chinese people, not just companies. And what I also saw and was um, you know, surprised in a good way that was happening is that there people were spreading messages on Facebook um, saying, hey, wait, we are anti-China. We're not anti-Chinese people. And you know, there have been plenty of ethnic Chinese people involved in the protest movements, um, you know, who may have been in Myanmar for generations too. So I think that oh, I got away slightly from your original question. Uh, yeah, so, so your observation when you were there, the Chinese, you know, like you already answered that part, uh, a lot of the influence, but does the Chinese uh, government satisfy with what is happening right now in Burma? Oh, um, well. Or would they want something changed? They want to go back to the previous 10 years or? I, th I think that, um, You know, they just won a tender with a solar farm. I think that the coup ultimately puts a lot of their um, investments at risk. Um, and so I think that they would not have preferred this to happen, but they're also feel politically that it wouldn't be wise for them to say anything against it, right? They're not gonna come out and say, we support democracy. Um, so, so yeah. All right, thank you, Naomi. Uh, so and I'm if, gonna. If I could, if I may sure, add go ahead. To this, uh, if I can understand this uh, correctly, Chinese has a very uh, strategic and commercial interest in this region. 
especially in Myanmar, which gives them a land route to uh, Southeast Asia, other than the sea route. If there is a, if in the in the future there is a blockade of that uh, sea route, it gives them an alternative route uh, to Southeast Asia, which is very important for uh, China. And uh, with the, the growing influence of India, uh, China, it is more important for China to uh, be in the good books of Myanmar to contain uh, India's influence also in the Southeast Asia. So these are the factors which uh, are governing Chinese response in this matter. Yeah. Actually, uh, Raul, there was, uh, I'm, I was about to go to you next, because uh, I, I do have a question, because based on what Naomi talked about, you know, and also M2 talked about uh, the, the Chinese investments in companies, uh, also, with, especially with the technology, India has, you know, uh, a lot of technology companies as well, computer science, and does India see the competition with China within the Burma in the either in the market or the 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 the, polit uh, the politics over there is it a good thing? Uh, India was hoping that the China can step in and just to make things better in Burma. I believe China is already there in Burma. It uh, has invested the trade between India and uh, Burma. If it is, uh, I don't know the figures right now, but it is if it is uh, two billion dollars, then China is uh, having a trade of fifteen billion dollars. It's ten times or uh, more than that. Uh, what uh, trade is happening between Myanmar and China. And China has uh, bigger projects in uh, Myanmar, like big dams, which uh, they are building, or uh, roads and other things, uh, infrastructure uh, they are building in Myanmar. India, of course, India is uh, there and they are investing in Myanmar in various projects. But the uh, basic concern of India is the security uh, aspect of it. As uh, I have he said that uh, because of that uh, issue of insurgency, which comes from uh, uh, Myanmar into India and take refuge in uh, Myanmar, that part is uh, in fact uh, a worrying uh, factor for India. If uh, the Indian influence in Myanmar or Indian friendship with Myanmar is uh, dented in any way in this matter. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Uh, so I will, we have about eight minutes left. I would like to <clears throat> use the rest of time to talk about what's you know in the future. So we know Aung San Suu Kyi, is she, is there any hope for her and the uh, NLD uh, to you know regain power? But also our one of our participants uh, uh, of the forum asked a question in the chat. Uh, it's related to this question. He says, the question says the military council appointed union election commission will consider deregistering the, uh, the NLD, the National League of Democracy and its leaders to be charged as treason. And uh, uh, forgive me if I pronounce it uh, not correctly. You think so? The uh, chairman of uh, UEC made the remarks at a meeting with the political parties at the union election commission office on May 21st, and more than 60 political parties attended the meeting. So I would like to uh, first ask M2 uh, to answer this question from our audience. Uh, what, do you, what is your take on that? Um, you know, majority of the, um, the people of Myanmar, <laughs> they, you know, when, uh, they, they keep saying that um, uh, all the international community, please respect our vote. That is our main concern. So it's meaning that the military, you know, the SAC, um, they, they don't need to, you know, the whole another, you know, the um, UEC, because we already done last year, November, uh, you know, the November uh, the, the 2020. So that's what we've been, uh, you know, they keep saying about that. So it is totally nonsense. And we, nobody, you know, they wanted uh, about this, uh, you know, the um, UEC again. And that uh, the military is, you know, the, um, they, they, they just like to uh, show something that um, it is, to be honest, is illegal. Illegal and, you know, the, the, uh, even the NUG, the National Unity Government, uh, they, they already, you know, the, um, released a statement and mentioned and that the uh, SAC is the terrorist. So terrorist is holding another UEC. So it is, uh, you know, the unacceptable and nobody won. And, you know, the, uh, you mentioned that it's about the 60 party attended this UEC meeting, correct? 
Yes, that's from the question of the audience. Yes, so they are, you know, they mostly, and you know, the uh, none of these party uh, got selected about the um, the Congress member. So those who are, you know, the who were attending this meeting. So you can imagine that. Thank you. And uh, I would like to ask Naomi to answer that question as well. Do you see, uh, you know, what is this new development means, and does in the future, do, how long is this group gonna last? And is Aung uh, Suu Kyi and her allies gonna back in power, uh, maybe supported by the West and democratic nations? Um, I mean, I think that the military's move to try to dissolve the NLD is history repeating itself, right? After 1988, um, you know, and the NLD won a landslide election, then, um, you know, the military then, you know, made the NLD illegal. So I, I, I don't think it's necessarily the end spells the end for the NLD. I think that um going forward um it, there is a civilian government um that m2 mentioned um that i think is really important uh the national unity government which was formed officially in april and it was elected lawmakers mostly from the nld and there also um a lot of leaders from ethnic minority groups um and they have they've done taken some positive steps. They're actually in conversation with different governments. They even uh, have created their own army. Now, whether or not that can really take on a Myanmar military that is, you know, been, it is thoroughly trained and has the most up-to-date ex expensive weapons, that's very debatable. Um, but that is there, and I think that's um, giving people hope and something to kind of rest their hopes on, that we have the civilian government and they are working. It's not, you know, working for moving things forward. Well, last question I'm going to ask you uh, as well. It's, it's a big question, so I'm sorry to put that to you. You know, we only have like three minutes left. So, of course, you say history repeating itself, uh, but then, uh, uh, you know, the past decade, the, the, uh, uh, the Onsai Suki, uh, with the support, you know, the people have been trying, trying to, uh, to make Burma a more democratic state. But then in the past few years, Onsai Suki had been uh, criticized by the West uh, because her dealing with the Rohingyas. So does the West and democratic nations feel it's 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 more difficult to support her uh, in this coup? Uh, we don't have a figure we can support to turn the tide around. Um, just quickly, a, a minute. Yeah, um, I think that yeah. To some degree, she was playing politics in her country. Does that excuse her not condemning the Rohingya genocide? Absolutely not. But there were some other factors at play, um, and I'm sure M2 has a lot of you know interesting thoughts about that. Um, sorry, the last part of your question was yeah. So um, with the West country, uh, yeah. So who should um, we support? Yeah, I mean, I think that the I think that the NLD and the democracy party, it's no longer just about her. Um, you've seen kind of a whole generation of young people kind of become political activists overnight. And I think that while there's a lot still tied to her, they're less tied to her. They're open to different leaders. And so the Western world, I think, has some different options. Wonderful, thank you so, th thank you so much, uh, Naomi. We have like 30 seconds left. So I would like to thank everyone participating today. Thank you. Global Strat View for hosting this event. And uh, the recording of the discussion uh, will also be put on Facebook and globalstratview.org uh, for your future references. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Harris and uh, GSW, GSV. Likewise, thanks for having me and thanks for moderating, Paris. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.